Hello. Thank you for coming to Mike. Thank you for coming to Up to the Challenge. I'm Dan Mazur. I'm one of the co-directors of Mike. And I also want to thank um, our new venue host, Boston University. Um, if you don't know, this is Mike's 13th consecutive year. We, 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 we were able to keep it going in one form or another through the first two years of the pandemic, and now this is our first year back in a big live venue, and our first year uh, hosted by the Boston University School of Visual Arts. Um, not coincidentally, it is the first year that the School of Visual Arts, Visual Arts has launched its um, Visual Narrative uh, graduate degree program. Visual Narrative is what you must call comics if you want to do that as a graduate degree event. Um, <laughs> so it should be a great program. It's uh, led by Joel Gill, a master and educator and longtime friend and participant of Mike. Um, so if you think that uh, that kind of graduate program interests you or anyone you know, uh, check it out. Um, I also wanted to point out that MICE is sponsored, uh, produced really by VCAP, which is the Boston Comic Arts Foundation. It's a 301, a 501c3 charitable organization that we started so that uh, not only so that MICE could accept donations, which we would love to accept from anybody here, um, <laughs> go to the welcome desk or the, uh, or the MICE website, also so that we could expand. We also uh, uh, sponsor the uh, Boston Comics and Color Festival, which happens in the spring. And uh, we uh, sponsor various educational um, programs, and hopefully soon we'll be also supporting individual comics artists. So if you like the sound of all that, uh, consider supporting DCAT. Um, if that's not uh, your thing uh, and you want to be involved, I would strongly encourage thinking about volunteering for MICE or Boston Comics and Color um, you know, next year. Uh, it's a great, fun way to get involved with uh, the local arts and comics community. So without further ado, I would like to introduce um, Gina Gagliano, who is the moderator of this panel, and I think we'll then introduce the panelists. Um, and we're very happy to have Gina moderating this panel. It's really a great uh, privilege. Uh, Gina has spent over a decade and a half in the book industry, helping authors make and share great graphic novels and coordinating events. She's worked with First Second Books, Random House Graphic, the Boston Book Festival, and Avery Hill Publishing. And I think we're all lucky to have Gina uh, guiding this great discussion. So, take it away, Gina. Uh, thanks so much, Dan. And hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Up to the Challenge, celebrating LGBTQIA graphic novels. Uh, we have an awesome panel today. Will you all introduce yourself? Colleen, starting with you. Hi, uh, my name is Colleen A.F. Venable. That is my real middle name, uh, and Felicity. It became a thing on the internet. Um, I did the book Kiss Number no. 8, which is what I'm here for. Woo! It was one of the first graphic novels ever to be nominated for the National Book Award. I'm super, super proud of it. Ellen Crenshaw did the art with it. Um, and I also have a series called Katie the Cat Sitter with Stephanie Yu. Oh, yeah. um, and I also had the chance of working at First Second for years when it used to just be four of us. I was the entire art department and Gina was the entire <laughs> marketing department. So um, there's a lot of people that are like, I know your name. And I was like, a First Second book. <laughs> you saw my name on the flap. So I'm really excited to be here. Not excited that we are talking about this topic because it's a very sad thing that's happening in the world right now, but really excited to be on this uh, stage with all these great people. Hello, my name is Maya Kobabe. I'm the author of Gender Queer, a Memoir, which is my first full-length book. Um, it came out in 2019. Thank you. It was re-released um, with a hardcover and a little bit of extra content this year, and it was, unfortunately, the most challenged and banned book in the United States of last year, and at the rate we are going, it is likely to be the most challenged book of this year as well. But we won't know until the end of the year. Um, yeah, and thank you for having me, Mice. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm Dr. Laura Maria Jimenez. Um, I like to put the doctor there because people often don't believe it. So I sort of feel like I need to have like a little card that's a little mini doctorate. <laughs> Um, I'm the academic on the panel. Uh, I work here at BU. I'm at the uh, BU Wheelock College of Education. My scholarship is in the uh, representation of underrepresented uh, and marginalized communities in children's literature. But my, my love is in graphic novels. Mm. Um, and so that's why I'm here. I am a consumer of visual art. I am not a producer mm -hmm. of visual art. And so that's, I want to make sure that nobody asks me to do anything <laughs> performative. I will read the hell out of a book. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Steven Toropov, uh, pronouns they, them. I am the teen librarian for the Boston Public <coughs> Library's Roxbury branch. Um, in that capacity, I work with the library. I am on the committee that makes our uh, pride book list every year, mm -hmm. picking the best books in our collection with an LGBTQIA theme for the previous year. And I also am uh, the person who orders all of the teen graphic novels for the library that are not my manga and mm -hmm. are not superheroes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everyone, this is gonna be a great panel. Uh, so for the structure of this panel, we're going to start out with a reading from Maya and then one from Colleen to introduce us to these awesome books if you are not yet introduced or, you know, have a dramatic version for you all to see if you've already <laughs> been introduced. Um, and then we're going to have some discussion and end with some LGBTQIA plus graphic novel recommendations for you all. So uh, stay to the end. That's the important yeah. part. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Maya, can you kick us off yeah. with a reading? I would love to. This is the cover of the new hardback edition. And this is the cover of the original edition. So this is a selection from Gender Queer, a memoir. I decided to talk to my mom about it. I know I told you ages ago that I'm bi, but I think now that I'm probably genderqueer too. What do you mean? Well, I'm still sorting out what it means and how to explain it, but like I've never felt female or identified with being female, specifically things like having breasts or having a period. No one likes having their period. I mean, I know. But I feel like it goes deeper than that for me. My whole life I've wished for a magical way to switch between genders so that you could be male sometimes. Sort of, but not exactly. It's more about not being female than being male. You don't have to be super feminine to be a woman. I'm not. I know. But like, you don't hate having a vagina, do you? No, of course not. I hope you don't hate your body. No, I don't hate my body. I don't have chronic pain or any of the other health issues so many of my friends deal with. The majority of my body is great. There are just a few bits that I don't like. For example, if I could just remove my entire reproductive system, that would be ideal. But what about having kids? Ugh, I've told you a hundred times, I am <laughs> never having children. I wish you wouldn't say that, you'd be such a good mom. No, I wouldn't. I'd be constantly resenting the kid for taking up all of my time. I am way too selfish for parenting. <laughs> Plus, the thought of growing a parasite being inside my own body makes me want to vomit. Parasite? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> About 24 hours later, I want you to know that I never thought of you as a parasite while I was pregnant. <laughs> oh, um, good. I remember when I first realized I never had to have children. It was like walking out of a narrow alley into a wide open field. I never have to get married. I never have to date anyone. I don't even have to care about sex. These realizations were like gifts that I gave to myself. I first met Jane B. at Galen's family's annual New Year's Eve party in 2003 when I was 14. 
Jane B. E. is a writer and zine maker, a collector of ephemera, owner of an art house in San Francisco, Granny's University of the Imagination. The first person I'd ever met who'd won NaNoWriMo. <laughs> what is NaNoWriMo? National Novel Writing Month. You try to write a whole 50,000 word book in just 30 days. What? You've done that? More than once. <laughs> 50,000 words in one month. My mind reeled. Jaina and I lost touch with each other and only reconnected at the New Year's Eve party in 2015. What have you been up to for the past decade? I've been ordained as a pagan priestess, And I identify as non-binary now. Wow, me too. Tell me more. <laughs> For me, female presentation has always been a performance, a fun performance with sequins, glitter, and wild hair. But for a lot of my life, I've felt like a drag queen in a female body. That makes perfect sense. I've been thinking about switching to they, them pronouns, for, but for some reason, that doesn't quite feel right. What pronouns do you use? I use the spivic pronouns, E, M, air, as in ask M what E wants and air T. E, M, air. <laughs> I love those pronouns. I just got the biggest tingle down my spine. That was my reaction, too. Asking people to start using new pronouns for me seems like such a huge request, though. I know people will mess up, and then what do I do? If I correct someone, will they get mad? I'd love to use those pronouns, but I don't want to inconvenience people. So instead of asking people to do something to make you feel more comfortable, you'd rather just feel a little uncomfortable all the time? You'd rather internalize and carry that discomfort every time someone who loves you misgenders you? Well, when you put it that way. As I pondered a pronoun change, I began to think of gender less as a scale and more as a landscape. Some people are born in the mountains, while others are born by the sea. Some people are happy to live in the place they were born, while others must make a journey to reach the climate in which they can flourish and grow. Between the ocean and the mountains is a wild forest. That is where I want to make my home. And now, Colleen. Thank you. <laughs> That's so good. I just got all emotional again, and I've read it before. Um, hi, my name's Colleen, and I'm going to read a little bit from uh, Kiss Number 8. And I'd like to start out by setting the time period. So this was set in 2004 is when I started writing this book. And to remind you what 2004 was, this was 2004. Okay, it was a long time ago. It doesn't sound that long ago. It was a long time ago. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of the book, but I want to give you kind of the framework and the reason probably why it's wound up on so many banned lists, well, the reason, is uh, it's all about a girl realizing that she likes girls. Though as the book goes on, so it's a coming out story, but it's also a coming out story that happens multiple times. She realizes she likes girls, then meets a boy that she has a crush on and is completely confused. And here we have, um, just it goes through their kisses, whoop, page up. It goes through every single kiss she had until her eighth kiss, which is the first time she kissed a woman. So I'm just going to start at kiss number six. Uh, I could just let you know they're all really gross before then because anytime you kiss someone when you're in middle school, it's bad. I promise you. I don't quite remember all of them. I wish I didn't remember more. Kiss number eight. But none came close to the awfulness that followed kiss number eight. Listen, I get out. Laura, I didn't mean, I said, get out, get out. So this is one of the great things you could do with graphic novels. I'm going to spoil a little bit later in the story. Uh, the reason Laura is upset is not because she kissed a girl. You find out later it's because she said her other friend's name while they were kissing. Mm. But I wanted to have that twist. This is her father. One month earlier. You can't deny that he's totally hot. You're going to Hellcat. You know that, right? Shh, my parents are going to get pissed. I mean, look at those abs. Um. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Great. Now Adam thinks we're talking about him. <laughs> this is our body, which was given up. If we get more decent looking altar boys, maybe I'll stop drooling over our Lord and Savior. 
So this is me. <laughs> this is based on my first crush. Uh, my first crush, I was in church, and I looked up and I was like, I think I love Jesus. <laughs> and it's because the sculptor was very enjoying sculpting. Um, <laughs> Give it up for you, Adam Bells. So you're telling me you come to church because you have the hots for Jesus? No, I have the hots for that sculpture of Jesus. Shh, mom's going to kill him. Shame you never get to see the back. Betcha Jesus has got an ass that could crack a walnut. Hell, I bet it could shell a cashew. Ew. Clang, clang, clang. Oops. Oh, we missed some pages. Okay. What are you up to? Normal Sunday, tornadoes game. You should come. Uh, no. Who watches minor league baseball? Just a bunch of overweight old farts secretly hoping they strike out because there's no way they're going to run with those beer babies. How about you, Laura? Well, maybe it'll be good to not be in my house for a bit. Woo, makeover, Laura. Say goodbye to Laura's forehead caterpillar. Goodbye, Amanda. I shall miss you. Stop that. Hey, Mom and Pop Warham. Mrs. Stevenson tells me she heard you girls use the Lord's name in vain. How many times was it? Ugh, I don't remember. Eighteen! <laughs> Eighteen times. We weren't using it in vain. I was praising him. And besides, it was only like 13, maybe 14 times. And I'll never eat a cashew again. <laughs> no idea what she's talking about. Jim, stop encouraging them. Girls, we let you try it, but no more sitting together. Dad, we didn't do anything wrong. I'm sure Adam was flirting with someone else when he forgot to ring the bells. Ew, he's like my brother. Ew, he is my brother. Eh, he did have a decent growth spurt lately. <laughs> what? Like you guys didn't notice. Let's go. If we leave the tornado crew for too long, there won't be any food left. Need a ride, cat? Never again! Lord help us all. Nineteen! <laughs> I believe. And this is uh, at the end of the book, you find out all her other kisses past eight, including my favorite, Zoe. Um, so yeah, we will... Go on from there. Hey, Maya, Colleen, thank you for those awesome readings <laughs> and these awesome books, which you should all go check out in the exhibit hall after this panel. Um, so we're going to go from there into some data from 2021 about banned books and talk a little bit about that. Um, Starting with here, uh, this is a slide from PEN America, which is a national liter literature literacy organization. And it's a chart about the subject matter of banned content by percentage of unique banned titles. Um, so as you can see from this chart, uh, the, the top bar here, 41% of titles that are banned are banned having LGBTQ plus themes, protagonists, or prominent secondary characters, uh, closely followed by 40% of titles having protagonists or prominent secondary characters of color. Um, panelists, any, any thoughts about this, this bar graph here? I think that it's pretty clear that books are often not being challenged actually because of their content, but because of who the authors are, and it actually almost doesn't matter what we write about, which is a good example being Colleen's like very sweet middle grade book where it's like it seems almost impossible that like that panel is a reason and it's more about who the author is and them living a happy life as an adult person showing like a the potential in the world yeah it, data like this is also really useful mm -hmm. because every individual challenge they will always have some reason that mm -hmm. is not what that it, you know, it's mm -hmm. some specific content or something, they will cloak it in a million different things, and then when you look at a data like this, we're like, okay, well the library has definite <laughs> subject headings for all of these books that say that like, what is going on in these books, and we can then put in, okay, you challenged all these books, and oh hey, all of our subject headings, 41% of them had, had queer primary or secondary characters. Mm -hmm using that kind of larger data presentation really can put the lie to a lot of the convenient fronts that get yeah. put up on things because there's there's a lot of process involved that is never <coughs> these sorts of in, 
instances are always somebody trying really, really mm. hard. It takes effort to ban a book. Yeah. Right, I, I don't have time for that nonsense. <laughs> no, I mean, most, most reasonable- There's a lot of books I don't like. Yeah. Most reasonable libraries have, and I, this happen, schools have slightly a different process, but most libraries have a collection development policy that has a outlet in it for challenging requests for reconsideration or requests for recategorization. Mm -hmm. And we have that for a whole bunch of different reasons, and sometimes it is, I, I don't wanna say, we're, I'm gonna use the word valid not to mean that it's, like hatred is valid, but that there are usages of that that can sometimes be useful. You know, sometimes it's, oh hey, this is an issue I run into regularly, which is, uh, you know, my library decided to start ordering manga sometime in the early 2000s and had nobody who knew anything about the form, and so just bought all the manga they could with no, con no look at content and then put it all in the teen section and then every now and then we come across something that's like, okay. And that's a like reasonable like, okay, yes, thank you for filling out this form and letting us know that you think that this should be reconsidered. We will categorize it and move it to a different spot or that you know, it's a way for people to put up their hands on that. Mm -hmm. But then you get to, but it oh, is usually Usually there is some sort of part of the form that is, have you read the book? What is the specific pages? What is the specific mm -hmm. details? <laughs> Which usually the, the yeah. idea is the bureaucracy stops it. And if the bureaucracy is not stopping it, it means somebody is trying yeah. really hard. They often say it's because of um, violence and sex, but out of like the top 10 books, I don't even know if any of them have sex in it or violence, like I can't think of any that are making the list that really have them. There are books with a lot of violence. Every book about war has got violence. Mm. But they're trying to not say religion. They're trying to not say LGBTQ. Right. Um, they're just kind of, you know, they never read the book. And I love kind of trying mm. to trick them and ask them questions about the book that they've obviously never read but won't admit it. Mm. Yeah. I, think, I think one thing that I want to back up one step. I want to make sure everybody knows in the room what banning and challenging a book really means. Mm. Okay, and what it means is, is that libraries, so, so municipal libraries and school libraries, and in some cases, teacher um, book collections, so book collections bought by teachers with teacher money, which they don't freaking have to buy the books, but whatever, right? And they're put, brought into school property. Classroom libraries. Mm -hmm. Classroom yeah. libraries, mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's monies that are taxpayers funds going toward community resources that then are being removed from the community because one person, and often it is one person, mm -hmm. doing a whole lot of these requests, right? One person doesn't think it's appropriate or you know, developmentally appropriate or family oriented, whatever these reasons are. All right, and so it's it, the, the metaphor that I often use is I really hate pumpkin spice lattes. <laughs> like I hate them. White hot sun kind of hatred for them. Mm -hmm. I don't think you should do that to coffee. I don't think it's mm -hmm. fair. <laughs> I take it as an insult. <laughs> <laughs> but you're okay with someone else having a pumpkin spice? Am I okay with it? No. <laughs> but am I going to? But am I going to? What, am I going to stand outside of a? coffee shop and <laughs> slam them out of people's hands. Uh, no, I mean, because that's crazy, that's <laughs> lunacy, that's absolute nonsense. This mm -hmm. is the equivalent of me going around the city mm -hmm. and you know flicking people in the back of the head because they're drinking mm -hmm. something I don't like. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of opinions and an enormous amount of feelings about these opinions, but they're mine. Mm -hmm. Because I don't appreciate something does not mean that Maya should not enjoy that thing. I might judge them. I might have words. I might have even have a critique. But I'm not going to take it away. And that's what this is doing. It's literally taking that resource away from a community. Right? So I always want to make sure that's what it is. Right? That's and what we're talking about. Maya, you also dealt recently with a bookstore challenge as well, right? Oh, yes. Um, I won't go into it's a, a long story, but essentially a Republican congressional candidate in the state of Virginia sued a Barnes and Noble location, um, uh, saying that my book and one other book, um, A Court of Mist and Fury by Sarah J. Mass, which is a mm -hmm. prose uh, 
fantasy romance novel um, were obscene and should not be available to minors. And um, luckily, the lawsuit was overturned in August, and they did not appeal. So the lawsuit is now ended. But that was a case specifically against a bookstore, um, not a library. Yeah. So it's everywhere. Um, OK, so next slide. We kind of dived into this already. But um, we have a slide here from the American Library Association, censorship by the numbers from 2021. Um, and this is uh, reasons for challenges <laughs> all around sad. the United States. I like bleak. Totally evil <laughs> is the one that really gets me. <laughs> totally evil. Also, me. <laughs> Sorry, that's my. That's me. Makes See, white I told babies you. feel sad, moment. specifically these babies that you can't even speak yet or say anything or feel things. Yeah, it's really, uh, I mean, some of the things, like there is such a thing as outdated books. There are books that, yeah. you know, were produced in the 30s. You know, some that even won big awards, like the Newbery. Uh, you read them and you say, wow, okay, like Laura Inga's Wilder, perfect example. You know, reading those books, didn't think twice, grew up, read them again, said, oh my goodness. Yeah. And they're banned a lot of places. And a lot of times they're taking the name away from awards that Lauren Goes Wild the World no longer called that because we've realized in retrospect how horrible these things are. That is not book banning. Mm. That is keeping up with the times. And some of these things, it's like, okay, I get that. But some of these are just, my gosh. Yeah. And it's, a lot of it is people kind of misunderstanding the use and life cycle, life cycle of a book mm -hmm. in a library or a school. Yeah. It is, you know, the, the classic case for, for a long time was Huck Finn, which people would say, well, it uses the N word, thus it must be bad and we must not teach it in school without realizing that it is often used to explain racial attitudes of the time and to bring up the question of, OK, how is this book using this word? How does, is it OK that it's using that word? And how is, it, how is it OK to use it then? Or was it OK then? There are educational opportunities that a lot of people do not want to have. And that there's the life cycle of a book. A lot of people have the idea that it's going to be in there, and it's going to be enshrined forever. And everything that is in it is always going to be considered the unvarnished truth that we are promoting which is not how libraries or schools operate. It is, this is a text that we are going to learn from. Criticism and critical thought about it is often going to be a large proportion of learning from it. And after a while, it will probably leave the, leave the collection as no longer useful. It ends up, the other side of this is oftentimes, you know, people getting all up in arms about the library throwing out and banning books because, OK, but we only have so many space on the shelves. Nobody's checked this book out in 12 years, and it's ratty as all hell. So yeah, we, we threw it out. If you wanted it, you should have checked it out. And so there's always that continuum of that, that there is usage right, going through. Right, but the difference, the big difference, again, I'm from the education side. The big difference is, no, we do not believe in change. We do not believe in evolution. We do not believe in keeping up with the times or caring whether or not students are engaged in reading those particular books. We care in a literary canon. And you should always say it like that, literary canon. Yeah. <laughs> right? We believe very, very hard. We will hold on to the single, the single class novel written by a dead white guy <laughs> Or Harper Lee, because they thought he was they thought she was a dude <laughs> with the name Harper. We will hold on that to, with red hot fingers because we are afraid of, right? We are afraid of the evolution. Afraid of a new voice mm -hmm. coming in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got another chart here about where challenges take place, which is again from the American Library Association and last year's challenges were predominantly in school libraries and public libraries. Right. And remember, book banning is not specified for children's and YA lit. You can ban, I mean you shouldn't, I'm not saying like, ooh, you can ban. I'm just saying <laughs> banning is available for all, like Lady Chatterley's Lover was banned, Of Mice and Men has been banned, Probably right? Sigh. I mean there's mm -hmm. lots yeah. of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But they're going after the YA and, mm -hmm. and, and kid lit right now. Because mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. they're, protecting, they're protecting the children. 
which is, I mean, I'm sure we'll get into this later, yeah. but as somebody who works with teenagers regularly for whom presenting them with a book that they see themselves in is massively affirming to them and mm -hmm. makes them skip out of the library happy, mm -hmm. the idea that somebody is protecting the children by not allowing me to present that book to a child who needs it is offensive and difficult to deal with because it is... <coughs> Bullshit. It, in, <laughs> not in as many words, but it, yeah, it, it becomes hard. There's a, library science has, uh, there's a man named S.R. Ranganathan who, interesting, Problematic figure in his own right, but he wrote he has uh, he wrote some things that were called the laws of library science, and two of them, uh, the three big ones are, every book its reader, every reader their book, save the time of the of the reader. Those are the three things that a library is supposed to do: connect mm. books to readers, readers to books, and make it fast. Mm. And a challenge often in these cases are often about disconnecting that book from that reader because one person or a group within the community feels that that book isn't for me or my child, so no one should have it. Um, I have another slide here from Pen America of school book bans by state. And you know, happy to report we're a very low number here in Massachusetts, but you will see book bans all over the country even in the Northeast, um, mm -hmm. which we typically think of as very liberal. Um, yeah, any, any thoughts about this, this map? I was watching a, um, there was a library in Michigan that got defunded specifically because of three oh. books. Our books and Tilly Walden Spinning, which is excellent, you should read it, it's amazing, mm -hmm. buy it. So good. Um, and I was watching some of the footage, which was horrifying because you saw the librarians crying and just like feeling like their hearts were being torn out because they would not like take these books out of the library because they believed in kids having access to books and they knew the reason for these bans was completely unfathomable. And um, there's one woman that got up and it kind of made me laugh because she's like, this is not LA, this is not New York, this is not Grand Rapids. And I was like, <laughs> Grand Rapids, where's that? <laughs> so it's like, it's like trying to say that it's okay in these other places, but it's not okay. You should not have to be, like I was in Brooklyn for the last like 25 years, just moved to Massachusetts, yay, pandemic. Um, <laughs> I, lo I love Massachusetts too. But um, you should not be forced to move from where you grew up, from where you love, because you want to be yourself. And that just kills me to be like, oh, it's fine. You could go and be queer in New York or LA or Grand Rapids, but you can't be queer in your small town in Michigan. That's like absolutely not okay. And no one should accept that. It, it's also just on the geographic side. Like it, we in Massachusetts oftentimes try, tend to think like, oh, we're in a liberal enlightened state that, you know, it can't happen here, but you know, just as a quick anecdote, like me and my partner went to a wedding up in Maine uh, three weeks ago and we were popping into a local store to grab some lunch and the local paper, first thing on the local paper, two hours north of here was local school board has a, is having a debate about gender queer. Mm -hmm. And sorry, Maya. I... <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, it's, it's, it's everywhere at this yeah. point. Yeah. 30 so. minutes, welcome. Waltham is removing it. It's, they're not even calling it a ban. They're just yeah. calling it a remove it. Yeah. 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 That just kills me. We're not safe. There is no, there is no space in this country where you or I can be complacent. There just isn't. You are not safe. We are not safe. This is this idea of safe in the Northeast, safe in LA, safe in New York. We are not. We are simply, we need to be, what's the opposite of complacent? Vigilant. Pissed off. There you go. Pissed off, vigilant, active, yeah. active, active, loud. Yeah. Right, we need to be all of those things. You yeah. need to go to, you know, seriously, folks, go to a school board meeting. No. They are a wild ride. <laughs> Especially in the last 12 months. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 They're fabulous. Do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have another slide here from the ALA about 
people initiating challenges. Um, as I think Laura said earlier, we're seeing biggest percentage here from parents. Clearly there's a lot of we must protect the children energy going on with, with this. Um, so I want to make a note on that. Uh, Moms of Liberty has a how to ban a book <laughs> um, checklist. <laughs> Number one, be a jerk. Number mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. The unspoken. Be a mm -hmm. jerk. Uh, okay, and this is going to be our last data slide, but we'll just keep this up here. These are the 10 most challenged graphic novels of last year. Mm -hmm. And I'll note to go with the theme of this panel, uh, which is LGBTQIA plus graphic novels, you'll see drama, you'll see fun home, you'll see genderqueer, you'll see Meg, Jo, Beth, and Amy, where this is a retelling where Jo is dealing with her sexuality and is queer. And you'll see Ngozi and Pazu's check plays on here. Uh, demonstrating that half of these books are specifically challenged for LGBTQIA plus representation. They're not subtle. No, and yeah. also Joel Gill's Talented Tenth. Mm -hmm. Joel Gill is in the exhibitor hall right now. He's amazing. He had a great panel here earlier this morning. Mm -hmm. He's here. Mm -hmm. There's uh, Jared, I uh, can never pronounce his Krasoska. last name. Krasoska. Krasoska, Krasoska yeah. Mm -hmm. You did a uh, talk with him two days yeah, ago. Yeah, two days ago, yeah. Like, these are not people who are, like, these are real humans who are making a living as an artist, and it's, it isn't just a idealized, mm -hmm. like, perfect minority person. It's, mm. it's a person who comes to a convention to sell their stuff to, you know, put gas in the car. Mm. So I think the idea of the idealized person is very important. The lie that we want to tell ourselves, the lie that America tells itself is that we are somehow perfect. We are number one, big, big mm -hmm. foam finger. Right? But what we are is we are predominantly protective of and supporting white, mm -hmm. cis, male, straight, land-owning, Christian, and English speaking. Mm -hmm. That is the norm, that's the normative standard that every system in America is measured against. And if you are not, if you do not align very, very, very tightly to that normative standard, then systems including education, <coughs> libraries, medicine, law, mm. other They're systems, not built for you. They are, you are not they're that. Not yeah. just not built for you. <laughs> They are literally designed to exclude mm -hmm. and put you in danger. Mm -hmm. They're literally designed for that, right? This is showing us that, mm -hmm. right? This is not new. Do not think this is new. Do not think this is brand new in our country. This is as old as our country. This mm -hmm. is older than our country. Though it this is, the is what worst our country is designed to be. Ever been, I feel like. That's the one thing, I guess, well, just specifically with book bans, it is the most bans we've ever had as a country. Is that true? Uh, I'd have to look at the graphs, but okay. yeah, it's, it's definitely it's a, a hockey. A sharp spike last yes. year, at least in the, in the challenges that were reported to yeah. Pan mm -hmm. America, ALA, and the National Coalition um, Against yeah. Censorship. Yeah. I think 2021 was up 40% over uh -huh. 2020. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's a big jump on something mm. that's usually a pretty flat line. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, this question is especially for Maya and Colleen. Can you talk about your personal experience with you making books that get banned? How, how did that start with your books? How, how has it been? Um, <laughs> who wants to go first? I mean, I could talk because at first my book had the opposite. Um, because uh, it is set again in 2004, mm -hmm. and if you came out of the closet before 2004 or in 2004 in a Catholic community, guess what? It wasn't great. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got homophobia, it's got transphobia. Some of the horrible characters don't ever get like their comeuppance, mm -hmm. and people were pissed. So when it came out, um, I was actually surprised that I was getting more feedback of like people were like, oh my gosh, there's transphobic characters. And I was like, mm. it's, it's 2004. It's like, it's really like, <laughs> and um, it wasn't until, you know, the last two years that suddenly the other side kind of was like, 
I found out in my first band, and my initial thought was like, I'm in the cool kids club. Mm. And that lasted for like a week until yeah. I was like reading more and being like, oh my gosh, reading more about this town and about all the queer parents and about like all the thinking about all the kids over there that were queer and just realizing how horrible it was. And I purposely wrote this book as a way of having a queer character that like religion was not the bad guy in this book. And that was one of my mm -hmm. goals when I, wrote, I started writing this in 2004 and every single book with queer characters, religion was always the bad guy. It was like very mm -hmm. like black and white. And I was like, it is not black and white. I have aunts who are nuns, have been living together for 50 years. We don't question it. Mm -hmm. um, but they're incredibly supportive of me and my sister. And um, you know, it's just realizing that they don't always have to be the bad guy. So, the more I started thinking about the bands and the more I started reading about it, it's just like it is a punch to the gut every time you hear about a new one. And people get excited to tell you, and that's the thing that's strange. Mm. People are like, oh my god, did you hear your band in Florida now? Mm -hmm. Oh, did you hear your band in Virginia now? And it's like every single one is like, I just think of the kids mm -hmm. who need this book. Mm -hmm. And the number of emails I've gotten from kids that like have this book and have like written to me about like asking me how they could come out mm. now. Like, you, you know, you live in this bubble, you think it's not that hard to come out. Like, I'm basically everybody's queer. I'm confused mm. when people are totally straight. I'm like, really? Like, are you sure? Have you ever seen this person? No. <laughs> David Bowie? No? Really? Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so it's just, you know, it, it just wears you down. I can't even imagine. Like, every time I see something with queer, I just like, it just kills me. Because I know how good that book is, and I know how many kids need that book. And yeah, parents. thank you for saying that. Parents need your book. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, what, a couple of things I think stand out to me. And one is that uh, Gender Queer came out in 2019. You're, this did as well, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah they came year. out in the same year. Um, and I didn't hear about a ban until fall of 2021. So it had been out for two and a half years mm -hmm. at that point. And I had been. Um, I guess warned or maybe uh, consulted with a, a cartoonist who had also faced some book bans when I was writing it in early drafts. And he said, this book will probably be, ch be challenged and take it as a compliment that when that happens, but also maybe get in touch with like comic book legal defense fund and like make friends over there like yeah. preemptively. Mm -hmm. um, and so I braced myself a bit when the book came out. Mm -hmm. I was like, am I going to get a wave of online hate? Like, is there going to be, like I'm not, I'm not unaware that, that trans and queer and non-binary narratives often receive pushback online. So mm -hmm. I did brace myself a little bit for it. And then it didn't come, and it didn't come, and it didn't come. And instead, what I got was a ton of support and love and mm -hmm. really wonderful, warm messages from readers saying how much it meant to them. And then it won two major awards from the American Library Association, the Stonewall Honor, and an Alex Award. Mm -hmm. and that because it won those two awards, many, many librarians purchased it. And so it was then in tons and tons of libraries because many times the, well, you mentioned the, um, like the purchasing guidelines of libraries include buying award winners. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's very common mm -hmm. or maybe even universal. Mm -hmm. um, and so then it was just in a bunch of libraries because it had won these awards. And then the challenges started around the midterm elections of last year, and I really think it was because a couple of Republican candidates made book challenges and like parents' rights to dictate what students were reading in the classroom mm -hmm. a talking point of their campaigns, and it was successful for a couple of them, including the, the governor of Virginia who won. And so I think that sort of signaled to other people like this is a successful talking point, and then yeah, the group's Moms for Liberty, which you previously mentioned, like started up that this as a whole, almost like a, yeah, like it's copycat case after copycat mm -hmm. case after copycat case. And I feel like um, at first it was just a couple and then it snowballed and then it was so many. And then I literally can't even keep track now of how many states my book has been banned in it or challenged. It might be all of them. I'm genuinely not sure. Um, and I think like I kept thinking over the past 12 months, surely this is going to die down. Like yeah. surely this is like the weirdest thing has happened and it's gonna like peter off after this. And no, it just literally keeps getting stranger and like things just keep happening. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, like I hear, yeah, about a case like the one you mentioned, the, the town in Michigan, which vote, that did not vote to pass a library funding bill over because libraries wouldn't challenge these mm -hmm. books. I, they're going to be able to put that bill back on the ballot in November. Yeah. So there'll be another chance. And it was in a primary and like I think like a very small percentage of the eligible voters even turned out. So I think yeah, the librarians right. are trying to publicize that incident and get the, the vote, the funding bill to pass. So I'm fingers crossed that it will. Yeah, absolutely. But anyway, um, just things like that where I'm like, wow, a town would rather not have a library. 
at all mm -hmm. than have a library with my book in it, which is just like, oh gosh. Yeah. Um, and I think, I just keep thinking, like, I'm used to things when they go viral, to have like a peak and then a quick die off when the next, you know, a celebrity says something yeah. stupid or a new funny cat is born on the internet or whatever. Mm -hmm. The corn song, we probably yeah, haven't heard it maybe this song, much this week. Wonderful, yeah. loved yeah. it. But like, I think partly it's like how much this, the book bans and challenges have remained so like present and current and um, in the news. I think a year later, we're still having this panel and I bet I'll be having this panel again next year. That is another thing that has, I think, been really surprising to me. Okay, so I want to shift our focus a little and um, talk, you know, this, this panel is called, uh, the subtitle is Celebrating LGBTQIA plus graphic novels. So, yes, because we love them. Yes. yes. They're good. <laughs> it turns out we like them. <laughs> That's why they're scared of them. <laughs> so why is it important for you all to, and it's exciting for you all to see um, LGBTQIA plus identities in graphic novels, and why do you choose to tell these stories or teach these stories or shelve these stories in your library and give them to children? <laughs> Everyone yes, looks yes. at the library. <laughs> yes. um, yeah. It's, uh, so I, I always try and very specifically like have a book for everybody. And, you know, it's, I try and keep an atmosphere in my library that is accepting kind of quiet, I mean, not quietly, but like, it accept, acceptance as the baseline. Mm. And that is, that means that it, that there needs to be enough of percentage of the collection is these books that it's not just, oh, I have... Maya's book and Colleen's book, and those are my two queer books, and right. you're, you're the queer kid, here, have this book. It's <laughs> enough that there's always gonna be one on the shelf, that it's a relevant but standard question when I'm doing a reader's advisory question. Okay, you want a romance book? Do you want it to be between two, mm -hmm. two men, a man and a woman, a, two women? What's the, like, just as a genre question? And because it legitimately means a lot to the kids who you give it to, or you know, even if they don't take out the book, mm -hmm. just seeing on display, oh hey, this is the type of place where the librarian has this book out, mm -hmm. okay, well then I can talk to you about, mm -hmm. hey, I'm in school and I don't know, what, what are my pronouns? Mm -hmm. What is going on here with mm -hmm. like that? It does a huge amount for kids to know that they have somebody who can listen, that there are resources there for them, that they are not alone and weird and broken, mm -hmm. because that, you know, I grew up in the late 90s, early 2000s, 2004, I remember that year. It was a weird, not great <laughs> year to, uh -huh. to, to be 12 and be thinking like, I don't know if I feel exactly like a dude <laughs> in 2004, yeah. and then you Huge went to the dude. library and, okay, <laughs> maybe there was one book about gay marriage because you're in Massachusetts, <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. Like, it, the, it is night and day now yeah. being able to be, have a, a space in, with, with students who are happy and accepted and can come up and say, oh, cool, or, not care, <laughs> and have that be not, it sounds weird, but having the books in the library lets the kids know that it doesn't have to be the only part of their identity, that they yeah. can come to the library yeah. and have it be like, okay, yes, I'm trans, but also what I really want to do is play Roblox with my friends. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. my favorite thing about like modern books with queer characters. I mean, like, yes, mine is a coming out story, like, you know, partially based on my sister's coming out. Um, I didn't even realize I was bi until my 30s. Um, and I was just like, oh yeah, those really intense friendships I have. Oh yeah. <laughs> she looked at me, oh my God. Um, <laughs> but it's just like, you know, I love books where it's just like, it's just any story. It's like, what kind of book do you like? You like fantasy, you like sci-fi, you like this, you like that. Cool, here's a book. Happens to have some characters in it that are queer or trans or any, it, like it just, I want just those stories because they represent the people I see everywhere. You know, like again, representation, it's so important to be able to see yourself in those in those books and yeah, during, you know, 
a certain time here when I was trying to sell Kiss Number no. 8, I had a publisher who rejected it, and they're t they said to me in an email, I still have, I'm sorry, we already have a gay book. Mm. And I was like, well, actually, she's bi or maybe pan. And they were like, no, no, no. <laughs> That's not what we mean. And, um, yeah. so and that think, wasn't that long ago. <laughs> so here's the deal. It back, African American children's lit scholars have been looking at this issue forever. And back in the 80s, Rudine Sims Bishop wrote this seminal piece, her dissertation work, and she talked about books being windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. Mm -hmm. Okay, a book can be a mirror, like you're saying, right? It yeah. reflects the identity that you are looking at, practicing, whatever. It can also be a window, so, ooh, what's going on over there? Interesting, right? And it can also be something that we refer to as a sliding glass door, that I can get lost in the book, I can have that experience, and that I can return to my own life. It is incredibly experience, it is incredibly important to have a representation of marginalized identities in books, multiple representations of marginalized books, in, uh, marginalized identities in books. It is also, and I would say equally as important, that people that do not have the experience of meeting those people, right? The, the predominance of isolated, monocultural, monolingual people in the United States is incredible. We are more segregated now than we were 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Books is a place that we can fight segregation. All right, now I'm not saying one is more important than the other. I'm saying both, both. are needed. Mm -hmm. And graphic novels specifically are a really important form for that. Partially it's just the like, you know, there is a movement within librarianship of and within education and generally of reading is reading. Yeah. The the fight of like, yeah, a graphic novel is reading, it's fine. I still have teachers come to me and say, I need I need real you book. to find real book. I need you to find real books for my class. And I'm like, but that's that's a, that's, that's a book, it's, a, it's got pages, it's got a story, it's, it's a book. Um, <laughs> but it's, specifically graphic novels are mm -hmm. such an amazing medium for this mm -hmm. because they allow for such unique visual expression. They, kids, it's what kids want to read, which is a huge, like you can have the best prose book in the world, but I can show you the statistics of how many of my YA prose books go out and how many of my graphic <laughs> novels go out, and trust me, I have a lot harder time keeping the books on the shelf on the graphic novel than I do in there, because that's what kids want. And the visual aspect, the way it blends forms, the way it kind of breaks what we think of as a book, when you think about how like a lot of queer identity is about finding exactly the right expression for you or what expressions or breaking out of a box. And it can be really powerful for kids to see that in visuals and also the way that graphic novels break out of a box. Is this art? Is this literature? Is a character literally breaking out of a panel in on the page? The visual metaphors work really well for the themes and it, Re there's such great literature in this area now. It's we're gonna get get to it. It's <laughs> yeah. mm. and in fact we have about five minutes left of this panel, so we're going to slide into a recommendation speed yeah. round. Yeah. Um, and so our wonderful panelists have hand selected these books to recommend to you all. Um, apparently there's handouts also. Um, the guy Way waving the, the handouts in the back is a dispenser of handouts, so um, <laughs> you you can get your own handout of these titles. Uh, Colleen, would you like to talk about some of these books that you have recommended and why they're awesome and people should pick them up? Um, which one do I want to talk about? I mean, As the Crow Flies, I feel like is not as well known. Melanie Gilman is incredible. They, yes. Yes. Oh, there are, is like the richest like colored pencils. Mm -hmm. Like if you are into art or an artist or have ever tried to use a colored pencil, you will see this book and be like, how? How did this happen? Mm -hmm. And it's an incredible story. Um, also has to do with like religion and spirituality mm -hmm. and the fact you don't have to choose one or the other, which I obviously like as a theme. So I'm gonna say As the Crow Flies, but Melanie Eagleman will be the one I will talk about because it is wonderful. Yeah, and Melanie is a character in my book Whee! too. So. I know. <laughs> 
Um, oh my god, I love all of these books. I think I've read all of them. Um, but I'll talk about The Magic Fish by mm. Trung Lee Nguyen, which is over mm. there in that corner, because I was just on a panel with Trung at CXC, <laughs> and it was absolutely lovely. And I think this is another one where it's a, a, a story of, uh, I mean, it's, 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 the, the relation to gender queers, it's about trying to communicate an identity to a parent who really does love you and really is supportive, but just doesn't have quite the language or maybe like idea of, like to understand what you're trying to say, but trying to keep bridging that gap, keep making that connection, keep like reaching out and ultimately having like a really like loving and warm response from your parent, which again is a theme that I love and <laughs> yeah. like writing, both writing about and reading about. So, yes. So I'm gonna be the bummer on the panel. Yeah. <laughs> just so we know, just be ready. Are you ready? <laughs> so just because a book's been banned and just because it uh, features LGBTQIA characters, does not mean it's necessarily a good representation of other identities. Case in point, Snapdragon. If you pick it up, it's got a great story. It's got an intergenerational uh, relationship between an uh, African-American girl named Snapdragon and this older woman, and it's really creepy and weird, and it's great. Not, and not romantic, though. Yeah. <laughs> no, <they, laughs> not creepy in that way. Friendship, <laughs> mentor, friendship, relationship. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Sort of friendship way. mentor. Good yeah. point. Thank you. <laughs> right? And then it turns out that, that, that the older woman had a thing with Snapdragon's uh, grandma, and so it's, it's, all, it's all really wonderful. And the relationship, yay. The issue is, is that the African-American characters in the book are drawn, and they have the cranial sort of face. You know the, the monkey emoji? Please look up the monkey emoji right now on your, on your phone, and then look at this book. It's a problem. African-American people are not well represented in this book. We as the LGBTQIA plus community have to do better about representing people of color because we are not doing well people. As a community, we have a tendency to be very white-centric. And it is a problem. And so I've seen this. Should she have included? Why? Why are these people black? I don't know. Did she just want to have Snapdragon's Afro puffs be able to go into different shapes? Not mm. a good enough reason. We have to be able to have those kind of conversations within our communities. So I'm going to be the bummer on the panel. Now you lighten but, things Laura, up. You yeah. Do, you yeah, bring it back up. <laughs> and then I've got two. Uh, two my, I can't pick just one. I'm going to go with two. Uh, first off, I'm going to give a shout out to Cosmo Knights because oh, I yeah. first read this book. I got this book at MICE 2019. Got it signed by Hannah. It is amazing. Really and the I'm just going to do the one quick one sentence summary that literally has a hundred percent percent sex rate uh, success rate of getting. <laughs> oh. Please, oh God, that's going to be on the inter internet. Uh, yeah, 100 percent success rate of when I recommend a kid this book with this line, they take it and they check it out. Lesbian space gladiators fight the patriarchy. Mic drop. That's all you need. Um, and then. Bouncing off of that, also in the sci-fi realm, is Across a Field of Starlight, mm -hmm. which is such a, I read it in literally one, one night, like a, a couple weeks ago, just like, oh, I'm gonna try reading this. Oh! <laughs> it is amazing, it is a, the best space opera I've read. It does a really great job of working with characters of color, it does a really great job of working with gender and sexuality, and it does the thing I love in graphic novels, especially sci-fi graphic novels, where it presents this future society where the problems aren't problems, right. or there are, they exist as like a struggle, or there is a different context for the struggle, but like the char main characters are both trans of some description. There's like five or six trans characters in the book. Transness is a factor of the conflict, and right. yet I would say that no character in the book is transphobic, and that's an amazing mm -hmm. way of doing things. Yeah. Mm. Laura, you have another book that you brought that you were going to recommend, Oh, right? I love uh, Legend of Auntie Po, yeah. mm -hmm. right, by um, Xing Yin Kor. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, it is a little bit historical fiction, and it's a little bit fantasy, and it's a little bit fabulous. It's a lot mm -hmm. bit fabulous, but I think what, for, for educators, we often look at the author's note as an important part of the meta text. Mm -hmm. And what I like about this is this author is Asian and she tells the story of the Asian community 
um, dealing with um, anti-Asian and racism uh, during the lumbering time. Lumbering time, that's not right. During <laughs> the, the late 1800s. Yes. There we go. During logging, right? And what she says is, um, I, uh, let's see. So she admits that she did not put indigenous stories in here. Mm. And she says, um, ultimately, when I look at liberties with history, I chose to do this because of our histories have been repressed and our people are not deemed worthy enough to document. I feel that we have the obligation to return ourselves to the narrative. If history has failed us, fiction will restore us. And she also says, the story of indigenous people and logging calves is complex. Many people are complicit in the erasure of Native Americans in the land, including black people, Chinese, and European immigrants. This book was written and completed in the traditional lands of the Tongva, the, the Sierra Nevadas, and the area in which this book took place was historically inhabited, inhabited by the Yakut, the Sierra Mohawk, the Midu Manu, the Northern Paiute, uh, sorry, Paiute, um, northern, the Northern Paiute, the Washoe, who still live in the region. Native Americans worked in logging camps, including the Sierra Nevadas, and some reservations also operated their own logging camp concerns. The, this history, like all of American history, is not a white story. Mm. Right? Her story is important. It's not a Native American story, and that's okay. She's challenging somebody to come in to write that story and for a publisher to publish it. Mm. So, and this, I've got a giveaway, so what do we want to do? <laughs> Anybody's birthday today? Oh, have you read it? That's close. Okay, wait. Anybody's <laughs> birthday today? Okay. Have you read it? All right. Are you ready? Happy birthday. To you. <laughs> wait, do we have Good job. Like... <laughs> okay, Maya, Pauline, do you want to do one last recommendation and then we'll close things out? Oh, my goodness. I mean, Prince and the Dressmaker. Oh. Huh? Huh? Beautiful Jen Wang, I love Jen Wang so mm -hmm. much. It is just the most beautiful, uh, the art is amazing. Jen Wang is also, if you are into like complex, but also still easy to understand like panel structure, mm. oh my gosh, mm -hmm. Jen Wang is the master. She is our modern master, she's like our Mobius. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, uh, I won't give anything away. I feel like that's one where you can't say much without giving no, it away. You, you should just yeah. read it, just yes. read it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll shout out The Deep in the Dark Blue by Nikki Smith. Um, I. As I mentioned in Genderqueer, was very into stories of a, specific, of a character like dressing up as the opposite gender for a disguise or to train to be a knight or something <laughs> like that as a kid. But all the ones I read as a kid, ultimately I did not relate to because the character in general returned back right. to the gender they were assigned at birth at the end right. of the story. Can't Nikki married. Smith decided <laughs> to sort of challenge that narrative and write a story about a character who has to go into disguise to sort of uh, protect themselves and during a political coup and then goes, this gender feels better actually. Yeah. <laughs> and then is trans by the end of the right. story. Right. Spoiler, but there's a lot of other stuff going on. <laughs> so. Spoiler alert. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for these great recommendations. Again, you can get a copy of them at the back of the room when you leave from the person in the yellow shirt. Um, I'll also note that um, one of these authors, Chad Sell, is an exhibitor this year, so oh, yeah. you will find Ooh. him on the exhibitor floor. And about half of these books are also available for, from Million Year Picnic, who mm -hmm. is set up in the exhibitor room. So if you're excited about them right now, you may be able to go and run and get a copy. Yeah. Um, two of our panelists are also right here at the show, and you can run yeah. and get a copy of their <laughs> books following the panel. What, what, where can people find you at the show? I'm at 33A, right, when you go in the doors, so the bigger, big room, yeah. I'm 73A, so I'm against a window, does that help? <laughs> Airs it down slightly. Yeah, I'll okay. be there. Use the convenient map. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and that is it for our discussion today. Uh, thank you, panelists. Thank for you for moderating. <laughs>